Open your Bibles with me one more time to Ephesians again at chapter number 6. Ephesians at chapter number 6 and the B part of verse number 17. Verse number 17, the B part reads, And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Thank you. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. This morning we will consider the final piece of the whole armor of God. All of the weaponry of our warfare thus far has been defensive in nature. The last weapon is the only one given that is offensive in nature. We have talked about the girdle of truth. They wore these long flowing tunics and they tucked them into that girdle, that belt, that leather belt around them that that pulled in everything is the girdle of truth and then they put on the breastplate of righteousness and they had their feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace they took with them the shield of faith whereby they were able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one and then last Sunday we looked at the helmet of salvation Uh, that broad sword that the enemy swung to either split the skull of his uh, victim or to decapitate him altogether. And uh, the devil is out to either discourage us or cause us to doubt God if he can't decapitate us and make us just atheists altogether. This morning, we want to look at the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. There are two words used for sword in the New Testament. The first is rumphia, a Greek word rumphia, which is the long broad sword that we talked about last week, used by the devil to try to split our skull or decapitate us altogether. It's this sword that's about four to six feet long, used to swing backwards and forward it had a blade that was sharp on both sides with a hand basket that one could put the sword in his hand and swing it around that's the rum fire sword that uh, the, the, the New Testament speaks about but that's not that's not the sword that Paul is talking about in this text the sword that Paul is talking about is the the Makaraya sword it's a short sword it's a knife like it's six to 18 inches uh, used in hand-to-hand combat uh, to either stab or slash the enemy. It, it could be used in the hand. It was not long, a long broadsword that could be swung uh, about four to six feet long. It was about six to 18 inches, more like a knife uh, used to stab or to slash. It was the kind of, of sword that Peter used to cut off Malchus's ear. Uh, Malchus, who was a soldier, Peter cut off his ear with this kind of knife, this knife that could be wielded in the hand. Peter used it in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Herod's executioners used this kind of sword, this kind of knife in Acts chapter 12 uh, to kill, to slay James, the brother of Jesus. The apostle James was, was killed by this kind of instrument, this 6 to 18 inch blade that was used to stab or to slash an enemy. The sword Paul has in mind uh, in the latter part of of, of this text is the latter of the two, uh, but it's not a physical, but rather a spiritual sword. It is the sword of the spirit, not the one Peter used to slash Malchus's ear, But it is the sword of the Spirit because the Spirit of God gives and inspires it and is needed for its interpretation. The spiritual sword is of the Spirit. It it originates from the Spirit of God, 
which is the word of God. This reminds us, brothers and sisters, that, that the Bible is not a man-made book. The Bible is not some book written by a man. It's not an ordinary book. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 reads, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Second Peter at chapter 1, verse 21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Brothers and sisters, the sword was the principal weapon in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And if you and I are going to do battle with Satan, Satan will engage us in close-up, hand-to-hand -hand combat. You, you won't be able to strike him from a distance. He's going to get close to you. And if, when he gets close to you, the only thing you have to defend yourself is the offensive weapon, which is the word of God. It was Napoleon Bonaparte who said the best defense is a good offense. And when you are going to do battle with the devil, the Christian who does not know God's word will not be able to use it well. If you don't know the word, you will not be able to use the word well when it comes to doing battle with the devil. That's, that's the identification of that sword. That's, that's identifying the sword. You need the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. But I, don't, I want you to look with me also at the importance of the sword. You need to know, first of all, what it is, but then you need to know how important it is. And before I move to how important it is, let me, let me say to those of you who are at home uh, with your Bible on the shelf uh, that you put your marriage license in or your birth certificate or your discharge papers from the military or you hide your money from your husband or from your wife or from your children in the Bible, blow the dust off it and read it. You, you're not going to be able to use it if you don't read it. And if you don't read it, you're not going to know what it says. And if you don't know what it says, you will not be able to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the devil because the only offensive weapon we have is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Since you know what it is, we need to look at how important the sword of the Spirit is. The term Paul uses here, I want you to get this, the term Paul uses here for word, let's look at verse 17b again, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The term Paul uses here for word is not logos. Logos, which refers to something said. It also refers to the thought behind the word. To illustrate that Jesus is the Logos. He is not only God, but he's the thought behind God. He's the thought beyond God. He is God in the Word. He's the Word, John says, chapter 1, made flesh who dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's Logos. That's the, the totality of the Word of God. From Genesis to the last amen of revelation is the logos. It's the whole Bible. It's the Bible in its totality. But Paul is not using the word logos here. Rather, he uses the term rhema. Rhema, which means an utterance. It speaks of smaller sections of individual words. Uh, it speaks of what is called uh, in preaching a uh, pericope, a small paragraph of scripture. Four or five, six verses or four verses at most is a pericope or, or, or the rhema, a particular utterance 
that speaks to a particular situation when you don't have to use the whole Bible. Let me see if I can make that make sense. When Jesus was in the wilderness of temptation, when Satan tempted him about turning uh, stones into loaves of bread, Jesus didn't say, let not your heart be troubled. Because that was inappropriate for that particular circumstance. So a rhema word is a word that is relevant, useful for a particular situation. In our everyday parlance, it's something like this. You've heard this saying more than one time. You don't bring a knife to a gunfight. That's, that's what a rhema word is. That, 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 that the idea here is you don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Uh, in, in times of temptation or satanic attack, uh, it is impossible and impractical to try to use the whole Bible to defeat the enemy. What you need is a specific word of God that speaks to that individual circumstance. Now let me see if I can straighten some people out. You, you hear these preachers on radio and on television talking about I got a rhema word for you. Uh, I got a rhema word for you. And, and in their thinking and in the minds and the hearts of the people who hear it, a rhema word coming from them is a new revelation. Rhema does not mean a new revelation. There is no new revelation. If it's new, it's not true. Because the word of God is already settled in heaven. And God is not giving any new revelation. Hebrews says in sundry times and in diverse places, he spoke through prophets and sages. But now he has spoken to us finally in his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is God's last word. 